So I'm going to talk to you about Merchants Trust, give you an overview, describe our investment process and how we, how we pick stocks, say something about how we are currently seeing life, how we are positioning the portfolio, and then say a few words about our twin objectives, which are to grow, pay a high and rising dividend and to deliver strong performance before concluding and taking questions. Um, if we, sorry. So looking at the objectives of the Merchants Trust, I mean, we, we are, what are we? We are essentially um, invested in UK equities and we think the UK is a great place to be invested. You've got some of the strongest standards of corporate governance in the world. And yet, despite that, you've got exposure to companies that are very global in the UK as well. So we've got this good combination of global exposure with strong governance. There's other things that make the UK attractive, and I'm sure I'll, I'll cover those later on. Merchants Trust itself has a high dividend yield, just under 5%. We've been able to grow the dividend every year for 39 years. So we are a dividend hero from the AIC. Um, and we have significant reserves in order to allow the board to smooth dividend payments going forwards. We have a really strong performance record based upon an active stock selection approach, high conviction, and with a valuation discipline, a value approach. And we have a low management fee, 0.35% of gross assets, total uh, cost ratio of about 0.58%. And we have a strong independent board of directors who are there to look after shareholders' interests. They are totally independent from the, the manager, which is us. Um, just the, the, the objective of merchants is to deliver a high and rising income stream um, together with long-term capital growth. And we do this through a policy of investing mainly in high yielding UK equities. Total assets are about 830 million pounds. I talked about the yield already. The shares have been trading at a small premium to asset value uh, generally in the last few months, and that's enabled the trust to, to issue more shares and grow the size of the trust, which actually helps in terms of uh, it, 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 it's accretive to the net asset value because we are issuing shares at a premium, and it also builds in liquidity for investors. There's a gearing. We have, we have long-term debt. I'll talk more about this later, but there's an element of gearing. The current gearing is about 12% in the, in the fund. Allianz Global Investors is a large investment company. We have about 570 billion pounds worth of assets invested around the world. About a third of that is in equities and about two thirds or three quarters almost is in, is in Europe. Um, now, the reason this matters to you and to our shareholders is, is not sheer scale for the sake of it, but it allows us to invest in, in people, to have significant resources around the world it allows us to have some really good systems. And it also gives us great access to company management. We can, as big investors, we can see the management of pretty much any investor, any company we want to, and have our own, our own discussion with them, our own dialogue with them on behalf of our clients and our, our shareholders. So being part of a big investment company really has some significant advantages to you, our clients. The direct team that looks after your assets, well, I head up the uh, UK equity team. There's, there's, there's four of us directly involved, myself, Matthew Tillett, Richard Knight, and Tom Morris, who is our product specialist. <clears throat> We've worked together for many years. We are actually surrounded by an enormous team of people doing all sorts of things, company research, uh, portfolio managers around the world, feeding in ideas. We've got a large sustainability team. We've got our own market research company called Grassroots. And when you're, when you're investing in companies that make products that might be sold in different markets around the world or specialist areas, being able to actually ask the users of those products, the users of those services, how they regard those services and products and, and what are the advantages and disadvantages of those particular products, that's really helpful. So um, Grassroots is quite a valuable tool. And on top of that, we have our own credit team and we have our own macro macroeconomics team. So we've got a lot of uh, resources coming in, a lot, of, a lot of help with what we're trying to do. Um, we manage across the team, we manage three, three UK equity products. The Merchants Trust is the largest, and that's what we're here to talk about today. But we also manage the Allianz UK Listed Equity Income Fund, and we manage the Allianz UK Listed Equity Opportunities Fund. Um, all of those products, all of those funds have first quartile performance over one, three, and five years. So we have a really good 
uh, record for all of those. Um, if I move on now to the investment process, we have a fairly simple investment philosophy, but the devil's in the details as always, but we're trying to buy materially undervalued companies. We're trying to buy companies that are cheap and we are therefore a value investor. Uh, in order to do that, uh, we, we tend to be a bit contrarian. We tend to be buying shares that for some reason are out of favor with other investors. We have to be op opportunistic because those to buy good companies when they're out of favor, you have to be opportunistic. That doesn't happen that often. Uh, and we run quite concentrated portfolios. We run quite high conviction portfolios where, where we see those opportunities in order to deliver good performance. But we are really conscious of risk as well. We think about risk in terms of the um, individual companies, but also at the portfolio level. In terms of individual companies, we think about the operating risk. So what is the chance of the profits going down? What was the chance of an operational problem at the company? We think about financial risk, how secure, how safe is the company's finances, how strong is the balance sheet, how much cash do they generate? And we think about valuation risk. If you buy a company that's highly priced, there's always a chance that the valuation can come down and that you can, you can uh, suffer as a result. But we also think about risk at the portfolio level. We think about sector positions. We think about how much have we got in cyclical versus defensive stocks or in, in domestic earners for the UK versus international, uh, financials, commodities. We think about all those types of risks uh, and build them together into a portfolio. I think for merchants in particular, we have a high income approach. We're looking to put, generate a high income and a rising dividend stream. So, so income is really important. Now that's quite a good place to be. Historically, investing in high income has, has given better returns than, than average. What we show here is, the, some data on the US market, which goes back the longest. This goes back over 90 years, so nine different decades of return. And in most of those decades, if you'd bought the higher yielding shares and sold the lower yielding shares, you would have delivered a significant outperformance. It works out about 1% per annum, just over that, over 90 years. Now, 1% might, might not sound a lot, but statistically, that is an awful lot of outperformance, and over time, it adds up. Uh, you can see that on the chart on the right-hand side. The other thing that sticks out a bit like a sore thumb, I suppose, is the last decade has not been a good period for income investors. In high yielding shares have underperformed in the US in the last decade, which is very unusual. But I think that's a great opportunity here because you've had a period where people have paid higher and higher prices for growth, and they've neglected many of the classic value areas and the high income areas. And that, I think, is a big opportunity. But we think that Income investing is not is not dead, has not passed its, its sell by date. We think income investing over long term will work. Now, having said all that, we are very conscious that not every company with a high yield is a good investment. Many of them are value traps indeed. So although we look to buy companies with a good yield, that doesn't drive the investment process. The way we do it is we search, we start by looking for companies with a yield in line with the market or above. And we look at, we take a view over the next 18 months. We're not necessarily focusing on just companies that have a yield today. But as I said, the yield doesn't drive the investment decision. We're thinking within that, sub, within that group of companies, we're looking for those where we think we can make a good total return. So we are driven by, by that primarily. Um, and we don't automatically sell a share if the yield drops. So if the share price goes up and the yield drops below the market, or in some cases, if the company cuts the dividend, we won't automatically sell it, we will review it, but we may well hold on to it because we're thinking about the total return we can generate. So what do we look for in a company? Well, we're really looking at three things. And we're asking three questions. How good a company is it? How cheap is it? And then I suppose what's gonna change? In terms of how good a company is, we look at the fundamentals of the business. We look at what competitive advantages the company has, how strong is its market position, how high are the barriers to entry, sort of classic stuff you'd expect us to look at. We look at the financial profile. We look at the governance around that and how the management team are incentivized. We look at the business model in the round. And we think in particular about environmental, social, and governance risks. They actually come in, we've got them in the center of this uh, Venn diagram here. We think ESG comes in at all levels, but in particular, what are the risks to a business model? 
And that builds a profile of the company, allows us to assess how good a business is, it is. We then say, well, we're looking to buy cheap companies. We're looking for companies that are cheap on valuation terms. In particular, we look at cash valuations, cash flow. Cash is a really good measure of company uh, profitability and company uh, um, value. We also look at asset backing. We'll, we'll do discounted cash flow valuations. And we'll look at, we're, we're thinking absolute return basis. We try and think, can we make money out of this business? So having identified good businesses that are cheap, we then say, well, okay, it may be cheap. It may look, may be a good company. It may look cheap, but what's going to change? And this is really powerful. We think about thematically what's happening. What are the long-term structural trends in this industry? And in particular, we're trying to find companies that have an advantageous structural trend. So for example, it might be the way that digital trends are affecting the business. It may be the way that uh, demographic changes are affecting it. And we're also trying to avoid value traps. Now, a value trap is a company that looks cheap. Uh, it looks like a good business, but structurally it's under pressure because the industry is undergoing change. And we're trying to avoid those. Uh, the other area of themes is cyclical themes. So, you know, what's happening, I mean, a classic one at the moment is defense spending. What's going to happen to defense spending for the next few years? Where are we in the economic cycle? Um, and, and so put it, putting all of those things together, we're essentially trying to find good businesses that are lowly priced, where there's a supportive thematic environment. And ESG can affect the thematic environment, absolutely. It can also affect the valuation. So it comes into all of those. And uh, happy to discuss that more later, if, if you like. I will come to an example in a minute, but just before I do that, I'm going to put it all together. So in terms of how we pick stocks, we start by looking at uh, those companies in the UK and, uh, and a few overseas uh, with a yield that meets our requirements, and then doing primary research, doing our own research, looking for ideas. We have our own, our own investment professionals doing that, but we also do look at external research as well, um, and we'll meet companies regularly. I've talked about the stock selection, the fundamentals, the themes, evaluation. When we get the portfolio construction, we're looking to build a portfolio of about 40 to 60 stocks. We want to have enough diversification to limit the impact if we get any one stock wrong, but we want concentrated portfolios so that the, the decisions we make are actually driving performance. We have high active share, which means high conviction, and we manage risk, as I talked about earlier. I think the sell discipline is just as important as the buy discipline. You can add or lose as much money from selling a company at the wrong time or not selling it at the wrong time as you can from buying it well. Um, and so we think about, has the valuation got to our fair price target? Has the investment case changed? And we're very rigorous at re at reanalyzing or re re um, reassessing situations. And are there better opportunities elsewhere? Very often, you, want to, you have to sell a share because you've got something else you want to buy um, and you, need, you can find a better opportunity. So that can be a driver as well. And all of that goes together to form the portfolio and build, help us build the portfolio. So just to give you an example of a, of a share that meets our criteria, this is a company we bought last year. This is Drax. Now, many of you will know Drax as one of the UK's or the UK's largest power station. And for many years, it was the UK's largest coal-fired power station. But it's completely changed its business now. It's, it's now burning wood pellets or, or biomass, uh, to be in more general terms. And so it's moved from being a, a big polluter to a much more environmentally friendly generator. The way that it's worth spending a little time explaining the, the business model because it's quite complicated. The way it works is they buy, they, they're, they're a sustainable forest, typically in North America, where each year a new, new bunch of trees are grown and the same number of trees or the same proportion of the forest is cut down. So the forest is sustainably grown. The carbon that's absorbed as the forest grows is the carbon that is taken down when the trees are cut down. Now, these forests are generally harvested for lumber, for timber for the construction industry, but there's a lot of spare, spare wood, either in bits around the edges, the small branches, twigs, residues that are left in the forest, also the sawdust in the mills. And those residue products are taken, compacted into wood pellets uh, and then shipped to, to the Drax um, power station to be, to be burnt. Drax actually owns a lot of those pellet facilities as well now, so they are quite integrated vertically in the supply chain. The carbon, the carbon dioxide that's released as these pro products are burnt 
is the carbon that's absorbed in the growing. So it's essentially carbon neutral. There is an element of leakage through the transportation and the energy in the process, but they're trying to reduce that. Where it gets really interesting is there's there, the company's tr hoping to move to uh, to absorb that carbon or to to take that carbon dioxide that's released when the carb when the wood is is burnt and pump it back underground in what's called carbon capture and storage. And if they can achieve that, they would be a, a massive carbon negative generator in the UK. And for the UK to achieve carbon neutrality by 2050, we are going to need some carbon negative activities where carbon dioxide is absorbed. And, and Drax could be possibly the biggest carbon negative uh, generator in the UK. So it's quite an interesting book business model. Um, we, we like the fact that it's vertically integrated. They also have some hydroelectric power stations and they provide other services to the energy network. We, we bought the shares last summer. At that point, there was very little in the valuation for what happens post 2027. And just to explain, Drax has contracts to 2027 to burn these wood pellets and they get um, various allowances or various contracts to cover some of the costs of that, which makes it very profitable. They're actually very benefiting even more from high energy prices at the moment. Uh, and, and after 2027, they need to sign new contracts uh, and potentially work on this carbon capture and storage program, which is a government priority as well. So at the time we bought it, there was very little priced in for the future beyond 2027. And we thought actually the business does have a viable future beyond 2027, even if it was just producing the biomass, shipping it around the world, um, and the other activities like hydroelectric power that they've got. So that was a good opportunity. Um, so, uh, and so the valuation was attractive and there was a lot of optionality if the company can get a contract post 2027 and can do this carbon capture and storage. Thematically, this is interesting as well. It's a business that is front and center of the energy transition. The chart on the top right hand side here shows how Drax has gone from being a very big polluter to one of the least polluting um, power stations or generators in Europe. Uh, I think the stock market had not yet realized that there was this big transition going, going on. If you look at the historic ratings of the company, it does screen as quite a high polluter, which, which um, doesn't really take account of where the company's going. Um, and so I think there's a big opportunity both. In so, so putting that together, it's a strong business. We think it's an interesting company. It was lowly priced. And thematically, I think it's benefiting from some of these trends uh, and the way the stock market is moving to value companies that are front and center at the energy transition. So it, it ticks a lot of boxes for our investment process. So now I'm just gonna talk about portfolio positioning and, and the way we see the outlook. Uh, clearly, there's a lot going on at the moment. It's, it's uh, you know, we're, we're in difficult times yet again, I suppose we've seen a number of different um, crises and, and situations in the last few years. Um, the economy is recovering from the pandemic. So the level of activity last year was quite muted and quite depressed. Um, having said that, the geopolitical risks are clearly front and center. And so there's a lot of issues to contend with. There are issues of supply and interruptions of supply and also and inflation, uh, but also confidence. Uh, inflation is picking up. We're seeing dramatic rises in commodity costs particularly energy. We're also seeing rises in wages and we are seeing supply disruption. So all of that needs to be taken into account from a context where we were starting with quite high growth coming into the year. I think company, uh, sorry, I think government policy remains very supportive. Interest rates, although they're going up, are still very low. So government policy remains very supportive. Uh, interest rates are low and the government is spending a lot, uh, clearly, to stimulate the economy. And we're going to get a chance for a statement tomorrow. I think they'll be, they'll be trying to do more to offset some of the cost of living pressure that we're all going to have to contend with. I think if you look globally, Europe is going to be more impacted, or likely to be more impacted than, uh, than, than the US. And the UK is probably somewhere in the middle. We are more energy self-sufficient, but clearly the cost of energy is, is going up and tied to Europe. Companies themselves are in quite a good position. They have um, generally rebuilt their balance sheets and rebuilt their, their profitability uh, quite well since the pandemic. And, and in particular, they've rebuilt their dividends and dividends have come back very quickly, quicker than we might have expected. And the dividend payout ratio has come down now that company profits are recovering. The chart on the right of this page shows that the payout ratio of companies 
has started to come down as well towards more normal levels. So that, that situation's encouraging. The UK remains one of the cheapest markets, and I'll show you some charts in a minute, and, and very polarized. That's really quite exciting as a UK investor. Has been the case for a number of years, but very exciting. And we're finding excellent opportunities, both amongst cyclical, but also more defensive companies to make good investments in the market. And, and all of that is leading to uh, M&A. We're seeing lots of acquisitions or proposed acquisitions of UK businesses because you've got a, a good operating environment, an, an open market and, and modest valuations and this polarization of valuations too. So just, um, oh, sorry, just moving on. In terms of valuations, I said uh, the UK is one of the cheaper markets. The chart here shows that the, on the left, the valuation of the UK compared to Europe on a number of different measures, looking back over 40 or 50 years. And we're as cheap as we've ever been in that period compared to European equities. And really since the Brexit referendum in 2016, there were always reasons not to buy the UK. The uncertainty of Brexit, the pandemic, which hit the UK quite hard. Um, but I think the UK is now coming out of that uh, arguably a bit quicker than some of the other countries. If anything, the composition of the UK stock market with more exposure to commodity areas, financials, perhaps old economy, you might call it, uh, is beneficial. So we're seeing a lot of interest in the UK. And then on the right-hand side of this page, you can see the dispersion of returns. The gap between high and low price companies is as wide as it's been, again, in 40 or 50 years, uh, wider than it was in the TMT bubble. And that means there's great opportunities for stock pickers to, to take advantage of that. In terms of what we've do, been doing in the last year, I won't go through everything on this page, you'll be pleased to know, we, but we have been active. We are active stock pickers, which means as markets move, as opportunities move, we do move the portfolio around. The one big change to highlight here is that we have introduced non-UK companies for the first time, well, for the first time in, in living memory, shall I say, in probably at least 20 years. Um, Merchants Trust was founded to invest internationally, but really for the last 20 years or more, has been invested only in the UK. But the UK has become quite concentrated, uh, particularly in the income area. So we have diversified into some European companies. You can see some of the reinsurance businesses there, and more recently BMW. Uh, so a few European companies we bought, which offer a diversification of end markets uh, and a diversification of income. On top of that, we've been taking advantage of Opportunities, some of the higher growth companies got derated last year. We were able to buy companies like Relex, HomeServe, good businesses at really attractive prices and other value opportunities. On the other hand, we sold companies where the valuations reached our target prices and where performance was strong, like CRH, uh, BT, Inchcape, Kin and Carter. Also had a couple of takeovers, Megit, Stock Spirits, where valuations rose. And there were a few situations where our level of conviction declined, so we sold those as well. So a lot of activity, happy to take questions, but um, it's been, we, we do, we are active value investors and you, will, you would expect a level of activity every year. If you look at the stock market, there's another way of breaking down the stock market on page 18. It's a bit complicated, I'm afraid, but the lighter blue bars or the lighter grayish bars show the stock market index. And if you look on the right-hand side, what we're saying here is, there's about 15% of the whole market on a price earnings ratio of over 24. So there's a big chunk of market on quite high, high, high ratings. In fact, quite a lot above 20. And on the left-hand side, on the same gray, gray bars, you'll see that there's a large part of the market, about 20% on a price earnings ratio below eight. So you're paying less than eight pounds for every pound of profit. And you've got this very unusual U-shaped market where there's not a lot in the middle and most companies are either highly priced or lowly priced. And that's quite interesting and quite unusual. Our portfolio in the dark blue is very much tilted, very much biased towards the lower priced area. Most of our companies are on price earnings, earnings ratios below 14. In fact, quite a lot below, below 10, actually, which is, again, quite unusual. Now, the challenge that comes from that, we often get people asking, are you buying low quality businesses? Are you buying weak businesses? in order to buy cheap companies. I would absolutely refute that. I think we're in a great market opportunity today where some really good companies are trading at unusually low prices. And here's some of the themes on page 19. So there's digital winners. There's companies like IG Group, which many of you will know, 
which is a financial trading company, highly regulated business model, um, market leader in the UK and several other markets, very profitable, makes a 50% profit margin and has got a great growth track record and is growing nicely in Japan, growing in America, growing in Europe. Interesting business model, single digit price earnings ratio, very modest valuation. So that's the type of company we like. S3, there's, there's undervalued growth companies. S3 is a recruitment company specializing in uh, science, technical, engineering, and maths. Uh, do a lot of IT people, a lot of life sciences people. They've just reported this, this week, they reported 29% year on year growth for the first quarter of their financial year because of demand for people. Now it's a cyclical business, but over time it does grow very nicely, very modestly priced. Uh, if you look at environmental change enablers, I've talked about Drax, but SSE is another business which operates renewable power stations, but also trans electricity transmission, again, front and center of the energy uh, trans, trans, uh, transition. So there's lots of really attractive businesses on very sensible or even very low valuations uh, with supportive end market themes. I won't go through all of that. Just bringing that together at a portfolio level, what you see is a portfolio of companies um, that, 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 we, that we like. What we show here is the largest positions. Now we're showing the positions here compared to the benchmark, compared to the FTSE All Share Index. We don't particularly worry about the FTSE All Share Index, but many investors want to know how we are positioned against that. So we show on the left-hand side the individual companies where we've got the largest active positions, the largest difference compared to the market. Um, and on the right-hand side, the sectors, which we like. So at the sector level, we like utilities, we like insurance, we like food, beverage, and tobacco, construction, so there's, and materials. There's a lot of interesting businesses in those areas. On the left-hand side, if we don't have a positive view on a company, we just won't own it. It doesn't necessarily mean we have a negative view on AstraZeneca. It just means we don't have a positive view, and therefore we don't own it. Happy, again, happy to take questions on that uh, later on. But just uh, the last area I would like to cover is dividends and performance. These are really important for Merchants Trust. So in terms of dividends, what you saw in the market on the left-hand side here is a very sharp decline in income and dividends in 2020 during the pandemic, and then a very sharp recovery in 2021 as the uh, pandemic ended and, and companies rebuilt their dividends. Highly unusual, but a very sharp recovery pattern. We are seeing a very similar position in the income that we're generating in the Merchants Trust. First half of last year, very sharp decline, slightly less in the second half, very sharp recovery in the first half of, sorry, that, that was 2020. Last year, very sharp recovery in the first half, and we will have seen a very sharp recovery in the second half. We haven't yet reported our second half to, to the end of January, but we will be reporting that in the next month or so and you can expect a very significant recovery in the second half of the year, a similar picture to the one on the left-hand side. Now, why that matters is we pay a, a high and rising dividend. And on page 23 of the presentation, you'll see the dividend paid every year for 39 years, this growth in growing tra trajectory. What we also show in green and red is how the directors have used reserves. The directors can put money away into reserves in the good years, in green, and draw on those reserves in the tough years to keep growing the dividend every year. They did it well through the financial crisis, and we've done it again in the pandemic. So going into the pandemic, the directors were putting money away into, into reserves. We drew on those reserves very heavily in the financial year to January 2020, which we reported almost a year ago. The year to 2021, we have, sorry, the year to 2021 was reported a year ago. The year to January 2022, we haven't yet reported, but we will still see a drawdown on reserves, but it won't be anything like the, res the drawdown we, we had last year. I can't give you the figure because we haven't announced it yet, but you should see an encouraging trend. And then we hope going forward to be much closer to covering the dividend in the year that we are currently in, that we just started. There was a quote from the chairman a year ago or April last year, which said, and it's really important, the board recognizes the uh, importance of growing, growing dividend to shareholders. We can see a path to a covered dividend in the medium term. 
Absent any significant further deterioration in the outlook for income, the board plans to continue with its progressive dividend policy and is willing to consider utilizing reserves built up over many years to, to cover any shortfall from earnings. There was a pretty strong commitment from the chairman then. And if anything, the outlook for income has got better progressively since that statement was made. So I would think the board is still confident on that. I can't speak for the board, obviously, but at the third quarterly dividend, they did raise the third quarterly dividend this year. So there's a statement of intent uh, that I think you can read into that. And although we are again in an uncertain period, we haven't yet seen anything like, in fact, we've not seen, we've seen very few dividend cuts uh, in the market since the, uh, the latest crisis has emerged. It's looking very different from an income point of view to that, to the pandemic situation and across our portfolio, if anything, the, the story on what we're actually seeing on dividends on the ground uh, is, remains, remains pretty positive. Well, so just in terms of our second ob objective, which is to deliver high and uh, sorry, deliver total return and performance, you may not be able to read this chart on your screen, so I'll give you the highlight numbers. The top chart shows the net asset value performance and the uh, share price total return. And we compare it to the benchmark in red. We've delivered very strong outperformance, something like 150% return, 160% in almost in terms of the, uh, the net asset value return over the last 10 years, compared to about 88% return for the benchmark. Now there's an element of gearing, so performance does move up and down a little bit with gearing and can benefit from that. If you strip out the gearing and just look at the portfolio return compared to the benchmark, that's what we've done in the, the bottom half of the table. We've delivered really strong performance. Over three years, for example, there's a return of about 10.7% per annum compared to 5.8%. So nearly eight, nearly 5% per annum outperformance over three years and about 2.5% per annum over the whole 10-year period. Um, at the portfolio level compared to the benchmark. So strong performance. And I would emphasize, this has been in a period there where value investing, which is our style, has actually been out of favor. It's been quite difficult to be a value investor in that period. And yet we've delivered very strong performance from our careful stock selection approach. So we've, 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 we think we've done a very good job in that period, but we're not resting on our laurels. We're not sitting on the same portfolio we sat on a year ago or two years ago. We are constantly looking to refresh that portfolio and find new opportunities. The final thing to say on the trust is we have gearing. We have about 13% gearing, but importantly, the cost of that gearing has come down dramatically from 2017. The cost of gearing has more than halved from over 8.5% in 2017 to 3.5% today or 3.7% today. And the level of gearing has also come down from about 20% to about 12 and a half percent at the end of the uh, at the end of the last financial year. So the cost of debts come down and the the amount of gearing has has been reduced as well. I won't say more about that, but again, happy to take questions. Which just leads me to conclude before questions on on really where I started that merchants is a differentiated proposition. We have a high yield, one of the highest in the sector, and we've grown that income for 30 nine years and actually it remains a really important objective and very close to the board uh, and, and a very key objective for the board. We have a really strong performance record driven by an active high conviction and value driven approach uh, and we've delivered that performance despite the value driven approach in a difficult period for value. We may be in a better period for value now and if so I think that will be a definitely a tailwind for our, for our style and our, our performance but We've shown we can deliver performance even in a more difficult period for value. And we have a very modest fee, one of the lower fee scales within the, within the sector and a strong independent board. And with that, I would gladly turn it back and open to questions. Thank you very much. Simon, thank you, Simon. Um, yes, uh, we've got some questions coming in already. Just a reminder to the audience, if you've got any questions, do do type them in the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. And if you see any of the questions that are already there that you particularly support and would like to answer first, then just uh, give them the give them a, a thumbs up and I will I will uh, deal with those first. Um, so in terms of upvotes at the moment, uh, question, do you expect to modify your sector focus in light of 
present circumstances and I suppose expected circumstances over the, the next year or so? Yeah, well, thanks for the question. Um, what we've been trying to do is retain quite a balance in the portfolio, uh, particularly in the last few years. It, it's been so hard to call the economy. And, and quite frankly, even if you've managed to call the economy, calling the stock market, is really, even if you know where the economy is going, is very difficult. So we tried to keep a balance between defensive sectors and cyclical sectors, between uh, resources companies and, and financials, and not be too biased either way. Now, within that, there are some clear preferences. I showed you utilities we like, um, we like insurance. Um, and so there are some preferences. We're not necessarily changing that dramatically. I, I clearly can't talk about what we've done in the last few weeks, but we're not dramatically changing our sector position. And I wouldn't anticipate that. We might, as a matter of course, take some profits in the areas that have, that have run very well. Uh, and and we've, we've done a bit of that. But no, we're not, we're not anticipating dramatic changes because of this. I think we did make some changes in, in the pandemic early on. We, we moved the portfolio a bit more defensive, having been a bit pro-cyclical coming into that. And we also focused on areas where there was a bit more certainty of income generation. But in this particular situation, we're not making uh, massive changes to the portfolio. We feel we're quite well balanced as it happens. And you can make the argument that the areas that have fallen sharpest, which are the more cyclical areas, Many of them were already quite cheap and actually deserve to uh, deserve a good place on a medium to long term view in the portfolio. OK, thank you. Um, want to hear about the gearing. Why such a high gearing at a time when interest rates are, are rising? Um, interestingly, that might have been written before the slide, the final slide on the gearing, yeah. because you're obviously historically at a lower gearing level at the moment. But um, it still looks high compared to maybe some of your peer group. Yes, I mean, it's it's a bit higher than the peer group, but it has come down quite a long way, both because of the rise in the, well, three reasons, the rise in the market value. There was a decision by the board, actually before the pandemic, to take the gearing down from 20% to 15 or 16, which was quite well-timed in the end. Um, but also, as we've grown, as we've issued new shares and grown the, the portfolio, the asset value, we haven't yet uh, taken on more, more, more gearing. So the gearing at 12.5%, I would say it's very comfortable. The Directors have a stated policy to be between about 10 and 25% uh, over time, and particularly when they draw down debt. So we're, we're at the bottom end of that range. I think the advantage of gearing, the, the reason we have gearing, there's two reasons. One is to deliver a better total return. If we can achieve return above the cost of debt, so above 3.5%, uh, and the income on the portfolio alone is about 4.5%, if we can achieve a return above the cost of debt, then we will add value over the long term. Secondly, because of the way we charge the debt to the, some of it to the capital account, it helps the revenue account and allows us to pay a higher yield, a higher income to, to investors and many investors really value the income stream. So the gearing helps with that. And I think at this level, uh, this cost of debt, uh, it makes a lot of sense to have gearing on a long-term basis. The only other thing I would say that people, the question was about the cost of debt. A lot of that is locked in for the long term. We took out some 2052 debts. So we've got a, we've got a, a security at 3.5% loan uh, to okay. 2052, which was locked in at times when interest rates uh, were very low. So we think that's quite attractive. And most of the debt is fixed, fixed rate. So not, very, not vulnerable to rising interest rates and, uh, and rising cost of debt. Okay, thank you. Um, it, uh, there, are, there are some other UK equity income trusts with comparable strong performance as well. Um, what would you define as, say, some of the key differentiators between the way Merchants approaches it and some of its peer group, if you could highlight any? Well, I think the first thing is we have a value bias, and, and some of the peers do, but many don't. Many have more of a, some have a growth bias, or uh, quality bias, and, and some are sort of more in the centre. Of those with a value bias, I think our record is actually better than than any. But um, you know, you can you can form your own own view yeah. on that. I think what really differentiates us is this thing I talked about the theme. So most people look at fundamentals of companies. Many will look at valuation. But I think our focus on long term themes. What what is structurally changing in an industry to avoid value traps? That's where we've added a lot of value. We've managed to avoid having say anything in the, much in the telecom sector for most of the period of the last few years when it was underperforming. We had nothing in tobacco when that sector virtually halved. 
Um, we've avoided some of the value traps. At, at, at the energy sector, we've come in and out of at quite a quite a good time. So we've, because of this focus on long-term themes, we've managed to avoid value traps uh, and actually pick up some really good companies that were genuinely undervalued rather than companies that just look cheap. That's the way I would describe it. But clearly, other people would have a view on the uh, the competition, which I don't know as well. Okay, well, no, that's that's helpful. Thank you. Um, thank you for your presentation. This one says, and also strong performance. You touched on uh, AstraZeneca, and it is the largest underweight. Could you expand some more, please, given that AstraZeneca has been performing strongly uh, as well? Yeah, I mean, it's um, as I say, we, when we don't own a share, it doesn't mean we're necessarily negative. It just means we don't have a positive view. We have been. I suppose nervous about a couple of things. One is the um, the cash generation of the company over many years was not as good as as you might you might expect. I mean, they've been paying until very recently. They've been paying effectively an uncovered dividend. It's been covered by earnings, but they've not been generating cash, and they've been going through a long long transition where they had legacy products that were going generic and losing patent protection and and declining, and they were investing in the pipeline to get growth. That growth has been coming through. They've done a really good job with the pipeline, but having visibility of that, we've not we've not had confidence, sufficient confidence in the visibility of that to to back it. And the cash generation's just been a bit disappointing. So we've, because we are so focused on cash, we found it difficult to get comfortable with the company. They've now done this Alexian deal, which does give them a lot stronger cash flow in the short term, but does give them a potential patent cliff in about 2025, 2026. So I'm not. I'm not knocking the business. It's a very interesting company. It's got a really attractive pipeline, but we've not had sufficient confidence in the cash generation or in the, I suppose, in the strength of that pipeline. It's quite difficult to assess, uh, to, to invest. Uh, and, and it also comes down to valuation. So it's not, it's not met, met our criteria, but I can absolutely understand why people might own it. Okay, thank you. Um, what's the smallest size of company you would uh, invest in? We don't have an absolute smallest limit, but we, the smallest company in the portfolio at the moment, I believe, is Duke Royalty, which is about a hundred and fifty million pound royalty company. Really interesting business model, um, growing quite nicely. We, where we have small companies like that, will tend to have smaller positions and may look to grow with the company. So if the company raises more money over time, we may well may well back it. Most companies would be four or five hundred million or, or more market cap, and of course predominantly large cap, which means about two thirds of the portfolio today is either in the FTSE 100 or the equivalent international size. But the majority of the businesses are over are in the FTSE 100 and, and above above that size. OK, thank you. Um, is, is there a limit to how much of the portfolio, <clears throat> excuse me, you will invest outside the UK? Yes, there is. Uh, there's a 10 percent limit. We we had nothing outside the UK until uh, February last year. And it's uh, the limits of ten percent. Okay, thank you. I think I just clicked on the wrong one. It moved there, um, uh, so I've ended up missing one. I think it was how inflation proof is your portfolio and your dividend. Um, I guess, uh, uh, well, how can you choose how you want to answer that? Well, one? So that's <laughs> a really, it's a really good question. Very, very topical question. I think there's. Yeah, I suppose the answer is varying to varying degrees. So we've got many companies in the portfolio that have almost explicit inflation protection. Take the utilities, where they where their their formula, the pricing formula is linked to inflation. They have an advantage. I think you've got com many commodity companies, energy and resources, where they're benefiting from high commodity prices, and so they can pass that. And uh, we've got companies that have got quite a good record of passing on inflation, such as food retailers. Um, most of the companies because they've been around a long time, actually do have quite good pricing power. Maybe not immediately, there may be a lag, there may be a short-term hit, but in the medium to long term, most of the companies in the portfolio are able to pass on prices. And of course, our cost of debt is largely fixed. So a bit of inflation is actually not such a bad thing when you've got gearing and, and, um, and fixed cost debt. Now, there's, a, there's, a, there's an ideal zone for inflation in around about 2 to 4%, where theoretically markets tend to be most highly rated above 4%. Um, that could be more problematic for both for companies and for market valuations. Clearly at the moment, inflation's above that level. The question is, where is it gonna come down to? 
I don't think inflation is going to stay at current levels. We would we would anticipate inflation coming down, but surely, clearly, in the short term, it's very high. Uh, so yeah, it's it's something we are keeping an eye on. When we meet companies, we're focused on it, but we're not worrying too much about short term inflation at the individual company level. We're trying to look through that to where we think they'll come out. Medium okay. Term. I assume you're building different expectations of inflation into your cash flow modeling. Um, uh, do do does it? Do you find that's changing the? Uh, do, does that change the sort of profile that you're getting in terms of uh, the screening exercises you're going through? Are different types of companies coming through more strongly? If your expectations in inflation are changing at the moment, it w- it will do. Um... I think the bigger factor for the market generally is the stock market has pushed high growth companies to really high ratings, largely on the back of low interest rates. And, and the theory behind this is that the lower the interest rate, the lower discount rate. So future earnings are worth more if interest rates are low. And today's earnings in relative terms aren't worth quite as much as the future. They're, they're not as important as future earnings. Now, many of the companies in the more traditional value areas like uh, you know, resources companies, um, uh, companies that are generating lots of cash today, relative to companies generating cash in the future, they've been derated in the market. So high growth companies have been pushed up to high ratings. If you think inflation is more endemic and, and more persistent, and therefore interest rates are likely to be higher, the discount rate goes up. And at least in theory, those companies earning a lot more in the future should be more, more lowly priced. And therefore, we would expect potentially that higher growth companies might derate compared to more modest growth companies. Our portfolio is very heavily biased towards companies where, which are not high, the highest growth areas, we put it. So yeah. many of them have got decent growth, but they're not the highest growth areas. So we could benefit from a perf- performance point of view if you see a rebalancing of this portfolio between high growth and lower growth businesses. Uh, I think that could be a bigger driver than than actually the individual company assessing their future prospects, where you know most companies that we look at are are actually able to pass on pricing in the medium to long term. Right. Okay. Thank you. Uh, why are you concerned with BT? I wouldn't say we're especially concerned with BT. We, uh, I mean, the telecoms area has been a very difficult area for the long term. It's quite competitive industry. It's very hard to show a competitive advantage or a. It's it's. I mean, if you, as a consumer, it's very easy to switch your mobile phone operator or your network actually, and and there's not a lot of pricing power. Now there was an opportunity last year when the telecom sector got to a really depressed level, to buy BT. In fact, we bought, bought BT and Vodafone. Well, I think some of those competitive dynamics are getting slightly better. Uh, the rollout of the investment in fiber might be building a slight differentiation, but ultimately it remains quite a competitive marketplace. And therefore, we have limited faith that the telecom companies have a strong competitive advantage compared to, you know, compared to each other. Therefore, yeah. although they're raising prices with inflation now, they're trying to push that through. I think from a consumer point of view, you can still trade down to... To alternatives, so I think there's the jury's out. Really, I would maybe the best way of saying it on on how strong their competitive advantage really is of companies mm-hmm. like BTT right. and whether they've got pricing power. So we we are we think that we think they're more fairly priced, or, or at least when we sold them, we thought they had reached fair valuation. Vodafone, we we still think is uh, is is worth a place in the portfolio. It's it's, it's cash flow is stronger than BTS today or in the short term and its valuation is lower. And perhaps you're seeing across Europe signs of consolidation in mobile networks, um, which would lead to a bit more pricing power. They've also got a very valuable towers business and a very valuable African payment business, which I don't think are reflected in the valuation of the company. Okay, thank you. I suppose I haven't looked at BT for some time, but I'm assuming there's still uh, that drag of the large pension fund to uh, consider in t- terms of their future prospects as well, if I recall. I don't know whether they're still having to fund it, but... Uh... They are. I mean, that's becoming less of a drag over time. The fund the fund is better it's better funded now. And of course, rising interest rates is, is helpful for pension fund deficits as well. Yeah, yeah. Um, your portfolio does not include infrastructure companies. Do, do you think they are overvalued at the moment? I, I wouldn't say that. We don't have, really have a view on infrastructure companies. We tend to buy individual companies. We don't tend to buy funds. I suppose the exception might be real estate investment trusts, where 
you know, we, we, we're not we're not really looking to invest in 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 funds there, there may be exceptional situations uh, but that's not a big part of our process we did own Balfour BT which had a big infrastructure portfolio for a while yeah um, but that's not really something we do okay uh, I've got a, a general macroeconomic one for you here um, somebody hoping that you can do something with the Bank of England to tame the inflation dragon and do you know whether inflation is likely to hit 10 percent feel free to uh, speculate on that one uh, i wouldn't want to put a figure on it i i think as i said earlier the a lot of the inflationary driver at the moment is commodity prices and and yeah. indirectly through commodity prices that feels not transitory but the you're not going to see the year on year acceleration every year um, they may stay high for quite a long time but the rate of inflation should drop as that just normalizes through and beyond that, wage inflation is definitely picking up. That's more tra- that's more permanent. But you know, the current levels of inflation we see as as likely to come down, but not back to where we were a year or two ago. Okay, thank you. And uh, w- this one's picking up on the gearing again. But what is your general strategy on gearing? I think you sort of touched on that. But is uh, would you like to elaborate a little more? Well, ultimately, it's a board decision gearing. But they're, they're, they have a stated range of 10 to 25 percent. I think gearing makes a lot of sense for the reasons I, w- I won't go through it yeah. again, but for the yeah. reasons I gave, gave earlier. I think at the moment, given the valuation opportunity we see in the market, I think gearing makes a lot of sense on a long term view. I would, has, I would emphasize we never think about gearing for six months, 12 months, even two or three years. It's a long term issue. Yeah. You've got to really think about it on the long term. Okay, thank you. Final question: What is your average portfolio turnover rate uh, at present? It te- it tends to be about twenty five percent. I.e., we tend to hold things on average for about four years. Now, that doesn't mean every company. Some companies we might hold for a lot, lot longer. It's been higher than that during the pandemic, and 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 more recently, there's been a lot of volatility in the market. That's thrown up opportunities, but it's also made us have to reassess. As I talked about earlier during the pandemic, reassess certain situations. So that naturally leads to higher turnover. Um, I don't worry too much about turnover. It's not something, I mean, we do track it, but it's not something we worry too much about. Um, But it tends to be, we tend to hold stocks for about three to four years on average. Okay, okay. Simon, thank you very much for your uh, help here and your presentation in general. It's been extremely useful. And uh, Merchants Trust is, uh, you know, quite a widely held trust. So I think it's very useful for our members as well to hear what you, your thoughts are and how it's performing and the future prospects. So um, thank you very much for sharing that with us today. And, it's been uh, an absolute pl- pleasure. Thank you. Right. And I hope to see you again sometime. So you're welcome. So uh, bye for now. Thanks. Bye.